Hello, this is a photograph of a town that I know very well, and it was taken at the end of the 19th century. You can see the cows walking along the high street. They're on their way home after a day in the park. Let me explain. These cows belonged to people in the, who lived in the town centre, and they were kept in stalls next to their houses. After the morning milking, they were let out and walked all by themselves down to the open meadows near the river. This area is now a public park. In the evenings, the cows would walk back to the individual stalls for the evening milking. No human supervision was necessary. Throughout most of human history, animals like cows were kept in towns and villages because the milk they produced was highly perishable and could only be sold near to the source, or shall we say, near to the udder. In fact, most ships which travelled between continents carried milk-producing animals like goats for the same reason. In London, in 1850, it is estimated that there were 20,000 cows. So there would have been similar scenes like that there as well, just on a larger scale. Even at the end of the 19th century, it was expensive and complicated to preserve products like milk, certainly for small-scale consumption. Human beings have been preserving food since, the, since human beings have needed to eat food. In other words, pretty much forever. Methods like smoking and salting were very, very widespread. And the further north you go, the more widespread these practices became. Preserving foods like meat and fish is quite straightforward. Making cheese is in itself a form of preservation. However, preserving other goods is not so easy. There has always been a problem of an abundance of food in, of one type in one area added to a shortage in another. And the reason for this is often that it is not always easy or even possible to keep the food fresh for long enough to transport it. The young Samuel Pepys recorded in his diary on one occasion when he had invited his boss to dinner that he had bought a sturgeon as the main dish and just before the sturgeon was about to be cooked, he was horrified to see that it was full of, as he put it, small, wriggly, worm-like creatures. Chilling as a way of preserving food has always been known about, but it wasn't always easy. What was needed was a decent way to refrigerate food, and we take the modern refrigerator for granted. But for a large part of us, even in the developed world, refrigerators were a luxury item well into the 20th century. Heavily insulated ice houses have been around for thousands of years. The earliest remains were discovered on the banks of the Euphrates and were probably working in about 1700 BC. Naturally, ice houses could only be used where climatic conditions permitted. Elsewhere, keeping food cool in order to preserve it was not really an option, and ice was absolutely out of the question. Then one day, a man called Frederick Tudor had an idea. He realised that if you could transport ice from the lake near his father's farm in New England and insulate it with sawdust and transport it to the coast where it could be loaded on board a ship and then sent to the ice to various Caribbean islands, you could make a heap of money. People in hot climates want to be cooled down. Up to this point, it hadn't been an option, but now it was. Tudor, in his own way, was a genius. He wasn't satisfying an existing demand. He went one better. He created a demand and then satisfied it. He was a shrewd negotiator and managed to gain monopolies in many of the island's administrations. Only his ice could be legally sold there and legally imported. This was, to many, a stroke of genius. To many more, utter madness. Genius because he understood that, effectively, Ice forms, free of charge, on lakes like Lake Wenham, where his father's farm was, every winter, and could be insulated to keep it from melting by using an utterly useless product of the timber industry, namely sawdust. Madness, because many people considered the idea of transporting large amounts of water on board a ship to be crazy, even if that water was frozen. It was crazy beyond belief. After all, the main purpose of ships was to keep the water outside the hull, not on the inside. Whatever people's opinion, Tudor was onto a winner. Ice was a cheap method of cooling foodstuffs, and it became phenomenally popular. 
With sufficient insulation and fast transport, blocks of ice could be transferred to the other side of the world with a loss of no more than 30% of its volume. The original product cost only the cost of the labor of cutting it, and the profits were enormous. The secret was sufficient insulation and rapid transportation, as I said. With the use of heavily insulated warehouses, trains, and ships, it was possible to transfer ice, for example, from Boston all the way to Bombay. There was a problem with the first consignment of ice to London. When the ship arrived in the port of London containing 300 tonnes of ice, the customs officials had no procedures for processing it. By the time they'd worked out the procedure to deal with this commodity, all the ice had melted and the resulting water had been pumped out of the ship. When the Wenham Ice Company was founded, it was claimed that the water of Lake Wenham in New England was so pure that it melted at a slower rate than ice from anywhere else. Indeed, in 1844, the Wenham Ice Company opened premises on the Strand in London, at the time the world's most important city. They placed a fresh block of ice in the shop window every day and regularly put a newspaper behind the block. People were amazed to be able to read the newspaper through the ice. Apart from creating a simple way of preserving food, the use of blocks of ice for refrigeration opened up trade to many parts of the world. Railway carriages chilled with ice could transport meat from America's Midwest to the hungry East Coast. In 1876, a ship called the SS Capone transported fresh beef from Australia to the UK. The beefs were packed in ice and sawdust, and the ship's hold was cooled by circulating air. This was a real game changer, although it wasn't recognised at the time. Places like Australia and Argentina and New Zealand had enormous capacity for, to produce meat for hungry Europe and America. In fact, the amount of beef produced in Argentina was so great that most of the meat from the animals was left to rot. Cow bones were ground up for use of, as in other purposes, like fertiliser for arable crops. With refrigerated shipping, meat could be transported to Europe on a massive scale. However, refrigerating ships with ice was never going to make a big enough impact because there were costs involved. What was really changed everything was mechanical refrigeration, which didn't depend on deliveries of massive amounts of ice, which took up valuable hole space, which otherwise could have taken more meat. All over the world, well-off people could have ice boxes in their houses. Naturally, other countries that had naturally occurring frozen lakes quickly jumped on the bandwagon and ice became a major, major tradable commodity. Using ice to refrigerate was gradually replaced by mechanical means during the 19th and early 20th centuries, but these technologies worked most effectively on a large scale. For domestic purposes, ice boxes which were fridges in which half of the compartments were taken up with ice, continued to be used, uh, and ice was still being delivered to homes and shops well into the 1950s, and in some parts of the world, way beyond. Ice boxes were simple, but it was inefficient and inconvenient to have regular ice deliveries. Better technology was needed. Work went on a pace at finding the mechanical way to refrigerate. Possible reward, the possible rewards for finding the right technology were enormous, and so many people got involved in the development of mechanical refrigeration. I have added a timeline of the develop, developers of refrigeration in the information below. In 1876, the French engineer Charles Tellier bought a 690 ton cargo ship and fitted it with a, a menthol ether refrigerating plant of his design. The ship was renamed La Frigorique and it was successfully imported a cargo of refrigerated meat from Argentina. This started a chain of events which transformed the economy of producing countries like Argentina and also devastated traditional agriculture in many European countries and Eastern American states. However, that's a subject in itself. Over the following decades, mechanical refrigeration using various chemicals continued to progress 
fridges became economical for domestic houses, but remained expensive and sometimes downright dangerous. In the 1920s, Thomas Midgley Jr., an American, developed the first chlorofluorocarbon uh, refrigerants, which replaced the more expensive and dangerous chemicals used before. After the Second World War, domestic refrigeration really took off, now at least in developed countries. Fridges are considered an essential part of the home. But wait a minute, did I describe chlorofluorocarbon refrigerants as a safe option? That's how they were thought of at the time. They weren't so safe for the ozone layer and had to be banned. That subject and how fridges work can be left for another time. Bye for now.